wonderful to be here tonight. To start, I too would like to acknowledge the Wongal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of this land. Pay my respects to their elders past and present. I wanted to add a few dot points to Cathy's introduction. Um, Dan mentioned that in 2020 she published her first book, Australian Women Pilots. She's been the editor of Air Sport magazine since 2015. She edited a book called The Big Storm, which was published in 2021 about a storm that devastated Victoria. A little bit more about her family, unbelievably, not only is Cathy a pilot, but her father, father-in-law, husband, Dennis, who I think is here tonight, son, daughter Millie, who I think is here tonight, are all pilots, as are her sister, brother, brother-in-law, and two sisters-in-law. <laughs> And finally, when she was 12, she wanted to be a chopper pilot after watching Skippy the Bush Kangaroo. <laughs> Please welcome Kathy. Thank you. Thank you. Kathy, you learned to fly in 1991, inspired by your father. Could you tell us a little bit about your early fascination with airplanes and pilots? Where did that come from? Uh, well, Skippy. <laughs> we all, because from Finlay, there was, it was probably um, two or three hundred miles to the nearest helicopter. So that was very fascinating to me. I love the idea that you could just hop in and just chop her away. You know? <laughs> um, and then Dad learned to fly in the 70s when I was at the end of primary school. And so the aeroplane became part of the family. And then when I was 16, he gave me the controls. And that put the idea in my head that maybe I could do this. And I thought, I'll come back to this one day. And um, so I came back in my late 20s. Mm -hmm. Dad did say he'd pay for it. And then when I came back to it, when I was 27, I think, 28, he graciously allowed me to pay for it myself. <laughs> <laughs> Which I did by working in a nursing home. There are two stories that you mentioned in the book that I'd like you to tell. One of them is about the stars, and one of them is about the shearing shed. Okay. So, um, the first book the editor said, publisher said, you need to write an introduction. And I thought, well, I've just written the whole book. Well, you know, you know who I am. And um, she said, I want you to write an introduction, make it long, put yourself in it. And that's a very difficult thing when you actually, I was taught at uni not to put yourself in the story. So um, I found it a bit challenging to write about myself. So I had to really dig deep and think about what qualified me to be the person to write this book. So that's how I came up with that story about Dad and the handing over the controls. And so with this book, it was a bit harder because I don't fly a helicopter or a balloon or I don't do any of the things that the women in the book do. So um, I, I think particularly the girls who fly, like Kirsten with the paraglider and Jess with the skydiving and all, all those people who jump off mountains and jump out of things and rely on that canopy to get them down. To me, that's kind of like pure flight, and I think, um, you know, you, as a kid, so I think what you're referring to in the introduction is, my dad took us all out onto the back lawn one night because it was too hot to sleep inside, and he's, we're all laying, well, a few of us are laying on the back lawn, and he's pointing out all the stars and looking at the Big Dipper, and that's the Southern Cross, and blah, blah, blah. And I remember in my little brain just thinking, whoa, it's so far, what would it, how would you get up there? what goes on up there. So it's just like a, I think we all have it to some degree, this fascination with the stars and with flying. And you look at birds flying above and you think, oh, that'd be fun just to fly away <laughs> from all your troubles. <laughs> I think it's kind of a, a fairly natural thing. Um, and the shearing shed. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, we, so, um, and then the next, and Superman was always on telly as well. So. We all love Superman, and so um, I'm the fifth of eight kids, and the youngest four decided um, that we'd see if we could fly like Superman. So we started jumping off the roof at the back of the house, and Mum came out one day, and she's like, what are you kids doing? And nothing, Mum, we're just jumping off the roof. And <laughs> I think she came out just as we're attaching the cape to the baby. <laughs> I think it was about three, you know. Um, it was a bit of an experiment to see if you could handle it. <laughs> and Mum said, get off there, you'll hurt yourself. And she went back to peel peeling the potatoes, and then we got back on the roof. And my brother reminded me, he said, our intention, if you remember, was to make the cape stream behind us like Superman. 
And um, our only regret was that we couldn't dive off the roof because that would have been really cool. But anyway, the roof was good, but it wasn't much of a challenge. So when we were at the farm, we started jumping off the shearing shed roof because that was a lot higher and uh, a lot more challenging. Yeah, and we've got some footage of that. <laughs> <laughs> so, Cathy, your book is about 10 extraordinary women. They include a skydiver, a helicopter pilot, a paraglider, a wing walker, and we're going to find out what that is for those of you who don't know. I didn't know. Some of those women are here today. Welcome to those of you who are. Thank you for being here, and thank you for sharing the stories in this wonderful book. I thought we'd focus on the stories. It's very difficult to pick because all 10 are so interesting. We focus on the stories of five of them, five of the women who are here today. Before we start to talk about each of those stories, I'm wondering, Jamie, if we could go to the amazing video that Cathy has provided. I should just say, Catherine Conway turned out she's the sixth member, but um, I didn't have time to put her in the video because I didn't know she was coming, but I just banged this together on two nights ago. So that's a leader, she's up the back somehow. That's my sister, Fran, who's all the trust in me. Um, that's how you watch your shearing shed, and that's me on the ground. <laughs> Come on, Fran, I'll catch you all. This is Jessica, speed skydiver, 424 metres an hour, head down. I think that's the most beautiful. Emma, Emma, Emma's really setting the pace for the women in Australia, so it's just a fantastic role model and a great inspiration. And everybody loves Emma. My brother, who's inspired about it, wrote this music for me as well. This step. Just scream your way. <laughs> we got a lot of step. <laughs> Steph's a mental health nurse, and this is what she does. <laughs> this is what she does to that's her in the mood of bird now. This is Alita out of Goru, um yes, Rocky Pop. Alita just flew in from Borneo this morning. She's been flying aeromedical rescue out there. Kirsten, who took me paralyzed off that mountain and took all my courage to run and jump. That was amazing. This is her practicing stalks in a minute. And, um, yeah. So she's got her instructor on her ears. She's one of the most experienced and hotter down paragliding, female paragliding. I don't know what her heart rate's doing there. But... <laughs> <laughs> he just told me she'd done a good job. <laughs> no, this is cheap, we've got her clothes there. That's a brand of a different angle. <laughs> this is Dominic, the poor brand of angle. We didn't bother, we didn't bounce. <laughs> That is so fantastic. All right, without further ado, now that our appetites have been wet with the amazing footage, let's turn to some of these individual stories. Let's start with the helicopter pilot, Alida Sima Winata. Sima Winata. Sima Winata. Who? Stand up, Alida. Yes, yeah, stand up. Good day. Yeah. Alida's on the top of the book, at the top. Um, thank you for joining us. That's amazing that you flew in this morning. Now, Alida got her helicopter licence at 30 after six years of lessons. How hard is it to fly a helicopter? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot that goes into it, I know. Yeah, I did actually have a helicopter lesson and I had to... Uh, I said to the guy, I think this is working. <laughs> I was like, learning the whole <laughs> I think probably more importantly is how hard is it to get a job in the industry. Yeah. Yeah. So it took a leader six years. 
because um, it's so expensive, it's probably twice the cost of getting your pilot's license. It's something like over $500 an hour, Vanessa. Is that right? When I did it, $550 an hour. Yeah. yeah. So she paid... So she paid for that by making coffee. She was a barista. Yeah. And it took six years. It normally takes about two years, so it took her six years. And then her first real... Sorry, I'm going to say her. I'm sorry. <laughs> Elena's first real job as a pilot was at the Uluru Kings Canyon Resort. Could you tell us a bit about her work there and some of the challenges that she faced there? Yeah, so um, her job at uh, Kings Canyon was to fly tourists on a, it was just like a very short trip, you pay the money, you've got the helicopter and you go and do a scenic flight around Kings Canyon and it was a great way to get lots of takeoff and landings and lots of hours, um, lots of experience very quickly. And I said to Alita, you must have just thought you'd died and gone to heaven when you got that first job and you arrived at Kings Canyon. And she said, I did, but you know, I'd only been there two weeks when um, there was a tragedy up on the canyon wall and a hiker was struck by lightning. He had a, a um, what do you call it, that holds the camera on? Tripod in his um, backpack and he was struck by lightning. And so it was a very dramatic rescue, none more so than for his family that were with him, but um, a leader was part of the group that helped um, with that rescue. So that was quite a dramatic introduction to her working life up there. Um, and then there was another accident at Ayers Rock uh, airport where somebody was seriously injured and so before she even really got going the whole thing was shut down and um, she had to, it was kind of a false start really. And then she got going again and loved it, loved doing the scenic flights and um, she learned a lot about the area and was able to give very detailed tourist, you know, guides, talks to the tourists as she was flying around and so she was quite popular I believe as a tourist guide and a helicopter pilot. Um, and then COVID hit and she did that long flight home, which I took that opportunity to explain what it was like for people in aviation during COVID, where to, for us to see um, all those A380s nose to wheel, nose to tail, you know, those springs in the desert parked up and everybody just wondered what was going to happen. Yeah, so um, she came home for COVID and then went back and had a very interesting time. And she worked, you write about how she worked um, at Uluru with um, the local Anangyu people, especially the women. I thought that was yeah. really interesting. Oh, yeah. So the Aboriginal women loved that a leader was a woman and she could fly them out on women's business and she was able to take them out to um, manage the business that they wouldn't have been able to do by air otherwise because, <coughs> because she was a woman. Mm -hmm. they and then in 2022, she upgraded her qualification to take a job flying a twin engine helicopter. Now, I don't know much about helicopters, but I'm assuming that's a degree harder. And that was to take a job in Borneo. Tell us about what she does there. So she took 10 grand out of her superannuation and eight grand out of her savings and invested in her, um, in another qualification in the hope that she would get the job once she got the qualification. So that's aviation all over. It costs a lot of money and it takes a lot of commitment <laughs> and secretion running the head. And um, so she got the job in Borneo and she was flying aeromedical uh, operations there. Flying, it's difficult flying in Borneo because, more difficult than here because of the weather, because of the tropical weather. There's lots of cloud, lots of bad weather, lots of big mountains. And um, sometimes it took some pretty fast decisions because that weather comes in very quickly and so I think that was only recently you put up an Instagram post about it was only because of my experience and knowledge of the weather that you're able to get to where you're going that day and somebody yeah. at the beginning of their career might have still been either you know, had a different outcome. So All right. weather is everything. All right, All let's, right. let's move to the wing walker. Right. Step, 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 step up. up. <laughs> so Steph, <laughs> welcome to Steph. Steph is a mental, as um, Kathy mentioned, she's a practicing mental health nurse. She also teaches mental health nursing. Her father was an aviation enthusiast who took her to shows from an early age and then she learned to fly in her late 20s. There are two aspects to Steph's story. So let's talk first of all about why you call her the Moomba Bird Woman. <laughs> Moomba. So Moomba is um, a, they have Moomba, the Moomba event is held over the long weekend in Melbourne 
and it's been going for 50 years or so. And it's a celebration, and part of that celebration is the very popular Birdman rally. But Steph being a woman, it has to be the Bird Woman rally. And um, Steph had been to, uh, probably to see it, had you? You've seen the Birdman rally and got inspired yeah. from there, yeah. And then she was in Europe and she saw some incredible lead light windows and she thought, oh, I'd like to make them. And so <laughs> she came home and created these three metre high butterfly wings in a lead light pattern to match the cathedral. And using cellophane and yeah. plastic. Cellophane and core flute and everything. Yeah. And she entered the Birdman Valley and they knocked her back and she said, you can't knock me back because I have to go to Nepal, I'm volunteering as a nurse in Nepal and I'm leaving in six weeks and I've got these three metre butterfly wings in my <laughs> and I have to get rid of them. <laughs> so there's some great, there's great photos in the book of all of the, um, all of the aviators, 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 I don't know what we call them, because it's so diverse. But she, I did write in the book, Steph actually has a, um, a private licence and I wrote, you know, she, understands the four forces of flight, which is lift, thrust, weight, and drag. Um, but with those butterfly wings, she ran towards that four metre platform, carrying plenty of weight and drag and precious little of the other two. <laughs> <laughs> she just went straight down. <laughs> well, I bet she looked spectacular. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> beautiful. So that was the story I wrote because I thought it was so funny. And um, I had a lot of fun writing that. And I've placed it in the middle of the book because I think by the time you get to the middle, you, you know, you're ready for a good laugh. So. so then the other aspect of what she does is equally extraordinary. She, in 2023, booked into the world's only wing walking academy in Washington. What is wing walking? It's um, <laughs> wing walking. So the Mason Wing Walking Academy is it was it's, it's been closed down just recently because it's, um, I don't know why the, federal, the American um, version of CASA thought it was not such a good idea. But um, <laughs> but luckily they were still going when Steve turned up. And um, so wing walking it was very popular in the 30s and in Hollywood they would often have people wing walking. Um, Patricia actually has done a similar thing where she was strapped to the top of the plane. And, um, but anyway, so Steph, um, they did a six hour training course and then they went up in an old Stearman, which is a, a 1930s biplane, and got up to about, I can look, <laughs> but don't look terrified. Um, they went up to about, was it 3,000 feet, Steph, or 6,000? 6, 6,000 feet. And then, because they can't communicate with the pilot, because she's sitting in front of him, and so he just waggled the wings, and she's like, oh, that's my sign to get out now. And um, so she undid her seatbelt, and just sort of, a bit like us getting up on Mum's shed, you know, on Mum's roof, she muscled her way out of the front seat and up onto the top wing of the steerman, and it's got a pole about the size of that tripod with a, just a bar and a seatbelt on it. And she had to manoeuvre her way around and then strap herself in and then laugh. <laughs> and they did two loops, two barrel rolls and two hammer heads. Oh, yeah, what's a hammer head? Uh, it's where you go up like that and then come over and do a stall turn and then come back down again to a plummet towards the earth. And um, so Steph look, takes every bit of bravery to do that. And being as brave as she is, she screamed the whole way. <laughs> she had tears and snot. <laughs> what I love training was that um, one month later Tom Cruise did it as well. Tom Cruise did it, yeah. yeah, but Steph did it first. <laughs> <laughs> and, sorry, I should say, then when she got back in, um, she said that was more difficult because she was looking down. And so when you're climbing up, you're looking up. But when you climb down, you're looking down, and that's quite terrifying. And they climbed back up to 6,000 feet because you lose a few feet when you're climbing towards the earth. And she got back up at 6,000 feet and he's given her another one of these and she's like, oh, okay, now I know what I've got to do. So she climbed out and stepped across the wing and um, they had a javelin between the flying wires because it's a biplane. So like so literally a javelin? That was what I was wondering. Like, yeah. is it literally just a... Literally... Like javelin. Yeah, wow. Yeah. And she and so then she had to lay on the javelin. I don't know if anyone... Horizontal? Else. Yes. With a parachute on? No. No. <laughs> 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 so she lay on the javelin 
one with her hands forward and her feet clasped at the back. And then in the video, she's going, <laughs> she's screaming again. And he did it again. Two barrel rolls, two, sorry, two loops, two barrel rolls, two hammer heads. And then he's like, all right, you can come back now. <laughs> and so she stepped back in. And then they went for a joy flight. <laughs> I love that um, the way that you write about how um, Steph describes what she learned from that. One of the things she learned was that she's more courageous than she realises. Yeah. I mean, just I mean, and to challenge herself. I mean, I don't know what you do after that, Steph. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go to the paraglider, Kirsten Seto. Kirsten, stand up. They're all sitting together, no. isn't it? <laughs> a little bit about paragliding. How risky is it? What can go wrong? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> um, I don't know the answer to those okay. questions. Um, I can tell you that I've been interviewing clients for about 15 years and usually when I go to do an interview they will say, would you like to go for a flight? And I go, oh yes. So I was driving up to Bright, which is about three hours, and I got halfway about Urara and I thought, Oh, she's going to ask me if I want to go for a flight. <laughs> I've got to have an answer before I get to Bright. <laughs> and um, so I watched her jump off the first time, do the, go for a fly. I thought, oh yeah, I can see how this works. And then she came back, uh, we came back up later in the afternoon when it was um, much calmer. And I thought, well, we fly around the Piper Cup, and that only goes at 80 knots. And, you know, if you've got a headwind, that's kind of like just being suspended. And so if I can get my head around just being uh, in the air, like in space, that is going to be the same feeling as being in a paraglide under a wing instead of beside it. So um, I thought, oh, well, she knows what she's doing, so I'll, yeah, I'll give it a go. So did so, it feel the same? It was better. It was the most beautiful thing I've ever done, probably, alongside ballooning. Yeah. It's just this feeling of pure flight where you... We ran towards the edge of the mountain um, and... So how high is the mountain? 20... It's only a little mountain. 2,200 <laughs> foot. <laughs> I think it's their training mountain, is it? Yeah, it's where they learn from. No, no, no. Anyway. It seemed quite big to me. And um, she said, as you run, you'll feel a jolt, and that'll be the wing. Um, inflating and lifting, and but you can't, you've got to keep running. And I'm like, oh, okay. So off we go. Go! She's all right, so off we go. And then it jolted, and it felt like she'd stopped. And so I stopped. She's like, keep running! <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and the only thing she didn't do was smack me in the back of the head. And so, and so we, um, I could, I was like, oh, this ends well. And um, anyway, we flew off, and, and we had nine minutes, I think it was seven or eight or nine minutes. And Kirsten was very gentle, you know, we flew off and she said, are you okay if we do a turn and look at where we've come from? And so we just did a gentle turn back and then we came down over the ridge line and the landscape looks completely different when you're that close looking on, you know, a sharp ridge. You don't really get that angle now unless you're in a paraglider or a, I've got a drone thing, you know, filming it. But um, it was divine, yeah. Let's talk a little bit more about how she got there, she, Kirsten got there. So I loved that she fell in love with flying via the movie Top Gun, which she watched when she was about 13 many, many times. She's now, no, she, and she started as a pilot, but she tried parachuting and skydiving. She's now done a thousand hours of paragliding over 15 years. And you make the point, um, Cathy, that there are not very many women paragliders in Australia. So. Could you tell us a bit about the course that she did in France and then when she came back from there and she tried the paragliding in England and something went wrong? Tell us about that story. So um, Kirsten will uh, be very quick to give you a talk about safety and about you don't know, if you don't know what you don't know, sometimes you've got to manage people who think they know what they're doing but you can see that they don't know what they don't know. And um, that was her first lesson was um, in England. So in France she went to do a paragliding course and they started on a very gentle slope and you run and then the wing lifts up and you, I think your feet lift off the ground and then you come back down again and so you learn how to take off and land and then eventually you get chucked off the hill. Um, so she finished the course except for the reverse launch. So you reverse launch when there's a strong, stronger wind, you turn around and lift the wing up behind you and then turn quickly and run. 
and um, because it was hard to line up the instructor and the weather wasn't quite right, and she never really got that bit done, but she went up for a weekend in England with some friends uh, paragliding and spoke to the safety officer and everybody seemed to think it was okay and it was just a minor point, you know, so she... That she hadn't done the reverse The reverse one, she didn't sort of seem to really matter that much, I don't think, and, um, but the wind was probably stronger than she... She didn't know what she didn't know. And so she launched forward off this slope and the wind was running up the slope and it caught her, par her paraglider and dragged her back up the slope and hooked onto a fence. And so she, the wind kept rising and the fence anchored her, probably just as well, God knows how you think enough. And, um, and then she came down with a resounding thud and woke up to her friends calling, um, there was a helicopter and then she ended up in hospital. And um, so that was a, uh, a close call, very close call, and has informed her attitude towards safety ever since. And so that's probably why she's done a thousand launches or more since then, and is very well regarded for what she does. And Kathy, you wrote that, um, so she set up in, um, in Bright, Victoria, which is where you, um, you went and did it with her. I love what you said about she started a program called Altitude with Attitude. What was that? So flying with men is different to flying, uh, being in a room of men, being around men is different to being in a group of women and the same with, was with paragliding. And so Kirsten decided to um, start a women's group, women's paragliding weekends. And so she said it's not to teach women, we're not instructing them, it's just to get women paragliders together just to have no different to me having a ladies' lunch, I suppose, or a girls' weekend away. And um, the women um, are just different to the guys, you know, not good or bad. Nothing wrong with the men, it's just that sometimes it's nice to be with the women. And Partly it was a response also, wasn't to sexism within the industry that she'd encountered and she'd seen other Oh, I think somebody had upset her at some point. <laughs> <laughs> she thought, I just want to get away from the men. Yeah. <laughs> just have a girls' weekend, yeah. There's also another lovely story that you tell that um, Kirsten describes about flying with eagles. How does she describe that? What does she say about that? Uh, she said, one of the most beautiful things is sometimes you can be out flying and she talked about um, flying with the eagles. How, like if you're in an aeroplane you see an eagle, you, you don't panic, but you're pretty aware that if you hit an eagle you're in trouble. Emma knows about <laughs> Emma had a big bird thing. Um, but for the paraglider pilots, sometimes the eagles, if they're mating, they can get pretty cranky and they'll come at you like a stinging bee and they'll peck at the wing and uh, so you've got to come down and um, get that fixed. But sometimes the eagles will fly with you. And so she's had experiences where she's been thermaling. So the thermal is the hot air going up. And she'll be thermaling and the eagle is thermaling. And the last, uh, well, we finished, I decided to finish her story with that beautiful image where she said I could see the birds, uh, the individual feathers, like testing and teasing the wind um, to see yeah, what was going on. All right, let's talk about Emma McDonald, who is the aerobatic display pilot, who we saw featured, I mean, you all featured beautifully, but featured particularly in that video clip. So, Emma flies an ultra-high performance aircraft and she does amazing technical manoeuvres at air shows. And I, I love all of these stories, but I, lo I really love this aspect of Emma's story. In May 2016, when she was 26, she was with her dad at an air show watching a world champion and former RAAF fighter pilot, Matt Hall. It happens to be standing in the doorway. <laughs> oh, he's here as well. Oh, that's wonderful. Welcome, Matt. And Emma turned to her father and said, I want to do what he does for a job. Eight years later, 2024, she now regularly performs at air shows with Matt, and he rates her as one of the best in the field. How did she get there? What was her path to, be, to becoming an aer to doing air shows, aerobatic performances like that? Um, so uh, Emma was a diesel fitter, and when she turned up to start her apprenticeship, the foreman said, he singled her out, you don't belong here, and you won't make it, and basically you get in the way. So Emma dug her heels in, and she got Apprentice of the Year, 
and he apologised, and they're now very good friends. <laughs> <laughs> so she was out on the tools in um, in Queensland, in Rocky. She was living in Rocky with her father, who was um, a very experienced crop duster pilot at Comet. And so she was around aeroplanes. She'd grown up around aeroplanes, and um, against the advice of her partner at the time, and um, most people, I think she was discouraged from taking up flying. And in the end, she just uh, dug her heels in, sold the house, got her partner, and went on her own path. You know? and so she learned to fly, and then um, she met Matt at a at an air show. And she said, how do I do this? And when I interviewed Matt for the book, he said, she was staring me down. I don't know what she was thinking. <laughs> but he said, she was very focused on what I had to say. And so he said to her, you've got to do all this training and endorsements and go and get all that experience and then see how you go. So I'm going to ask him, she'd written all this stuff down and kept that list very close. And um, she got a job down at the 12 Apostles flying a Grumman Ag Cap, which is what they use for crop dusting and uh, flying tourists around and she was doing instrument rating in Cara with Lynn Gray, who's in the last book. And um, somebody said to her, oh, I know this friend of mine is looking for someone, you know, and she's like, oh, whatever. Uh, she said, no, I've got to go back and I've got this great job down the 12 Apostles. And he said, it's Matt Hall. And she went, oh, no. And she said, I'm not quite ready for this year. I haven't got the experience. But she went, started off doing joy flights, ended up in um, management, so she's now head of aviation at Matt Hall, um, and started off doing joy flights and then slowly um, built up her experience and now her and Matt do very high performance um, aerobatic displays. And she um, is about to, I'm trying to think, well, you're heading off to Huntington Beach or has that been? Just been, yeah. So she just come back from her second stint at the biggest air show in the world, performing, yeah. Okay, the last one we're going to talk about. So did you come the next one? Sadly, the last person we have time to talk, the last story we have time to deal with is that of the speed skydiver. Jessica, Jessica Johnston. Where are you, Jessica? Jessica. <laughs> <laughs> now, again, you have to excuse me if these are ignorant questions on my part. You may all know what all these terms mean, but I didn't. What is speed skydiving? How's it different from normal skydiving? When I was um, wanting to figure out who was going in the book, I knew I wanted a helicopter, balloon, gliding, and after that I was a bit stumped because I thought, what else can you do? Oh, I should have a skydiver. So I asked around, nobody seemed to know too many skydivers, and so I thought, I'll go to Google. And I found Jessica Johnson, Australian champion speed skydiver. I thought, what the hell is that? <laughs> so, um, so I did a bit of research and then Conversations, the ABC Conversations, who interviewed me for the last book, contacted me and said, have you got any more good stories? And I'm like, wow, there's this girl. I haven't spoken to her yet, but you get onto her and then you tell her that I'm onto her. And, <laughs> um, and so Jess, um, what's the <laughs> what is speed skydiving? How is it different from normal yeah, skydiving? Just became a skydiver. She went to Cairns and someone said, the thing to do in Cairns is to go skydiving. And I wrote the book, I lived in Cairns for three years and I had plenty of things to do to work skydiving. <laughs> but she took up skydiving, absolutely loved it, found her place in the world. And she was in Maria packing parachutes, which is quite an important job <laughs> to get it right, pack the parachutes. And somebody said to her, um, all the barometric measuring devices have been shelved and now we're using GPS to measure the speed. So all the records are up for grabs. And she goes, oh, righto. And he said, she said, um, so what do I have to do? And he said, just go head down fast as you can. And I thought, oh, I love that. That's a <laughs> Head down fast as you can. So speed skydiving, you go head down fast as you can with um, all your belts and buckles and everything's, uh, you have a special suit for it? Yeah, everything's very schmick. Um, tucked away and streamlined. And um, what else is there to say about it, Jess? I didn't know actually know how to fly head down. Oh. Uh, she had to learn how to fly head down, yeah. I think I said in the book, got that, head down. So you, you say, and I read this somewhere too, that it's the fastest non-motorised sport on earth. They go 50 k's faster than a Formula One car and can reach 530 kilometres an hour. I know you haven't quite reached that, but you got very close to it. Poor old Jess. So, she, poor old Jess. She only got the 400. Yeah. So, so, 
Jessica started in 2015. She's now done over 1,300 solo jumps. She set world records and her PB is 423. Am I right? Yeah? Amazing. There's two stories I want you to tell us about with Jess. First of all, tell us about the horny gorillas. Who are they? They're her friends. <laughs> horny gorillas, I believe, is um, they all dressed up in animal onesies. And they, it's a, uh, like a basic a, a learning, like it's like a playground, isn't it? Yeah. So they link arms and legs, I think, and then exit the aircraft like in a playgroup, in a ring around the race. And because of the force of the, uh, the fall, it keeps them in place, is that right? And then you lean back with your legs um, intertwined and you thump your chest and make a noise like a gorilla <laughs> while, you're, while you're dropping at 200 k's an hour. <laughs> and if that doesn't work, then you just hold hands. <laughs> and then there was another really beautiful story you tell um, about a very special skydive that um, Jessica did that involved her brother, Daniel. So um, a pivotal point in Jess's life was when her brother passed away when she was 18, he was 21. And so on her 500th or 50th skydive, she um, did a wingsuit radio, which I'm sure you've all done at some stage. <laughs> <laughs> so you know what a wingsuit is, this thing with the back wings. And so um, the wingsuiter, what do you call it, wingsuiter? Um, he stood out onto the strut of the aircraft, the Cessna, and then Jess stepped out behind him and touched onto his shot, his back uh, parachute shoulder pants, uh, straps, and then they just fall away together, and he opens his wingsuit and flies like Superman, which is what I wanted to do off the shooting shit. I was very jealous of my wingsuit. <laughs> and, um, and Jess was riding him like um, a... Like, like a magic carpet, really, isn't it? So she was, she was laying down, hanging onto his shoulders while he's spearing along about 200 k's or so. Um, and she leaned over and from out of her top pulled out a little plastic bag and released part of her brother's ashes into the air. And she should have been sad, but she got down and she was, she was quite mental when she got down <laughs> because of the adrenaline, I suppose, and the excitement. And it was just a nice way to do it. So there's only a couple more questions from me, and then we'd like to open up to questions from the audience. So start thinking about your questions. Final question for you, Cathy, from me is, what does it take to be a woman who does what these remarkable women do? What are some of the qualities that you think, from speaking to all of them, studying what they do, what are some of the qualities that they have in common, do you think? Um, I think they have to have conviction. Um, faith in their own ability or the desire to learn, the, the, to be open-minded enough to go and learn whatever it is they need to know to achieve those skills or that outcome. So instead of standing back and going, oh, I could never do that, you do like Jess, who walked into the skydiver's um, office fresh-faced and said, oh, I don't know if I want to do this, and he said, you can absolutely do it. Took her skydiving, she's like, okay, how do I do it? Emma was the same when she spoke to Matt and said, how do I do it? And he gave her a list I mean, and she just worked through the list. But you have to have an inner strength as well. You have to draw or find that inner strength and draw on that. And another good um, thing that Heather Swan said, she wingsuited, base jump wingsuited off um, Mount Maru in the Himalayas. And uh, she said, I had to get rid of the naysayers. I had to get rid of the people who told me that I was stupid, or that I couldn't do it, or that I'd kill myself. You've got to get rid of those people, and then you've got to inform yourself about, understand what you're doing. Yeah. Okay, final Are question. Right, girls? I don't know. Yeah. Final question from me is that we've heard about how you tried paragliding, and I wondered which of the other adventures that you write about have you tried, or would you like to try? Oh, I'd love to go speed skydiving to sort of tell you. Yes? No. no, I never actually ever want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, why are you um, I 
had been I've been ballooning. So I, for the book, I went up with Donna Tasker, and that was the Women's World Championships in 2023 in Perth. And um, she let me go up with her in the basket. She wasn't competing; she was doing a commercial flight. And ballooning is one of the most divine experiences I've ever had. And there was about 30 women balloonists. Um, and again, it was you know like Kirsten's weekend. It's just that idea that there's all this girl power, you know, and there's 30 women flying off in these balloons competing, and they just look like a laser cut image across the sky. It looked too good to be true. So I love the ballooning. I've been in a helicopter whenever I could. I'd go in a helicopter, so I love the. Have you piloted a helicopter? I knew that once when I told the guy I was broken. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've been in gliders and um, uh, paraglider with Kirsten. Uh, I've probably flown in other things, I can't remember. <laughs> what would you like to do that you haven't done? Um, I don't know, no, I can't think of anything. No, aerobatics, I've done aerobatics as well. Right, so, uh, over to you now. We'd love to have some questions. You've, you've seen that wonderful video, you've heard Cathy speak so beautifully. We'd love to welcome questions from the audience. I know many of you are friends, colleagues, people who are featured in the book. Um, please, give us your questions. Nice question. <laughs> nice questions. And um, don't bring up that time where I. <laughs> um, and I'll be repeating them just for the benefit of the recording. But please don't be shy. Now's your opportunity to ask anything you've ever wanted to ask, Kathy. Yes, Sarah. Why did you want to write this book? Why did you want to write this book? Because after the first book, everybody said, why didn't you put a helicopter pilot in? And why didn't you put a glider in? <laughs> and I said, well, oh, they're in the next book. <laughs> but um, I think we, when we think about flying, we think about flying an aeroplane and sometimes maybe a helicopter. Rarely you think about flying a glider. You might think about a balloon if you've been in one. But I just thought it was good to share all this other stuff that you can do and enjoy. Yes. How many people do you think you have influenced through your now two books to actually take flight? Now that's a great question. How many people do you think you've influenced through your two books to actually take flight? I can't know that. I have had some feedback on the first book. Probably the most important feedback I got was from a woman who came up to meet the Women Pilots Conference in Broken Hill. And she said, thank you for writing that book. And I said, oh, that's okay. And she said, I was widowed and I didn't know where to turn next. And she was left with an aeroplane. And she said, by reading the book, I realized there's all these girls out there that I needed to connect with. And so I think she rang Shelley Ross, who's here. Shelley, over there. Um, she rang Shelley Ross and went, she said, I flew out here to Broken Hill. And that was just beautiful. And then on the last night, she walked right up to me and she said, thank you for writing that book. Um, the other one was a lady who'd escaped a domestic violence situation and she'd lost all confidence in herself and she was not very confident in the aeroplane either. <clears throat> and the instructor gave her a copy of the book and she messaged me and said that changed the way she felt about herself and she realised everyone's had challenges because a lot of the stories I talk about the bad things that happen. It's not all about this person's a hero because that's like, it's not real, you know. So you've got to talk about the tough stuff as well. And I think that makes the stories relatable and people are real people. So um, I know that Deb Laurie, who's here somewhere as well, <laughs> over there, um, Deb Laurie said she's given the book out a lot to young, young girls who are flying. So I, had I hate to think what's going to happen with the next one. If anyone rings me and says they're going skydiving, I'm going to be responsible. I had a related question, Kathy, which was, um, to your knowledge, are there many books out there about Australian women who've taken to the skies? I think usually they would be a biography or um, a self um, self published sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, memoirs maybe. Mostly historical. Emma hasn't written hers yet, but that would be a little way away. Um, I don't think there's as many. Not as many as men, because there's yeah. so many more men pilots. And that's how it started, because yes. every time we'd have to move house, I'd say to Dennis, 
Can we throw out some of these books? And like, no! Precious books. These books about male pilots. Um, yeah. And now they're my, I'm like, thank God we can throw out these books. <laughs> they're useful. Any other questions? I've got more up my sleeve, but I'd like to give you the opportunity. Shanti. Which one's the cheapest sport and which one's the most expensive? Which one's the cheapest sport and which one is the most expensive? I think Emma's might be the most expensive. <laughs> <laughs> the aerobatics. Mine goes um, high speed, high performance aircraft and performing around the country and overseas. Um, the air racing, you know, that's all um, I imagine is very expensive. I think helicopters are also very expensive. The cheapest? Mm. Maybe paragliding? Yeah, paragliding because Kirsten's story starts with her and her friend um, facing some personal challenges and they just wanted to get out of town for a day, a couple of weeks, a couple of nights, a couple of days. And so she just packed um, a, how heavy was it? You, 50 kilos and a thing, oh, the wow. backpack weighed 27 or something. Yeah, oh, no, 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 15. Oh, 15, there you go. And so she could just pack a lightweight tent, the paraglider, and a bottle of wine and light bread <laughs> and hike up the mountain. They slept overnight on the mountain, and then the next morning she jumped off it and flew down. So Easy, everyone can do it. Life insurance is most expensive. So suggest to me, I had a lawyer suggest to me I call the book The Uninsurables. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Yes, one in the back. I was just wondering if, the, if, if Kathy, if you heard from any of the ladies, if they're not competing, um, how they stay current in their particular pursuit? Do they just put their wingsuit on and go off on a Saturday morning? And, you know, so the question practice is. Practice. Yes. So the question is, I think, if you if they haven't been doing it for a little while, how do they stay sure. match fit? I guess. Yeah. How do they and how do they stay current? How do they keep themselves fit to to perform? Is that right? Well, Steph only do it once, so she doesn't have to do that. <laughs> there are no more currents in the wings here. Alida's working as a helicopter pilot, so she's current. Kirsten is it's her life mostly, so she's paragliding as often as she can. Um, Kath Conway, I don't know. How do you stay current, Kath? Uh, instructing. Instructing, yeah. yeah. And Emma does it for a living as well, so, yeah. Any other questions? It's their hobby, it's their life. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you, I know you've been asked already, but those of you who are in this room, who are in this book, could you please stand up so we can give you a big round of applause? <laughs> say thank you for writing these amazing women back into Australian history, Australian aviation history. The good news for all of you is that Cathy's now going to be out the back signing copies of her wonderful book. So um, it's a fantastic read, as you can imagine. Um, I don't know what you're going to do with the video, but it would, it would be let's great to be reading it. it. Yeah, 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 let's post the video. Uh, before we do it, can I just acknowledge Deborah Laurie and Christian Cowter are here tonight, and they're both in the first book as well. Different Christian. My grandfather built that.